recorded at the Kitchen Studios. This is the Pencil Pushers Podcast. Welcome, Leadheads. This is the Pencil Pushers Podcast, and I'm your host, Mike Rosado. Today, we talk with the incredible indie comic book artist, Matt Allison. Known largely as a creator and author of the comic book and title character, Kankor, Matt's talents are immediate from cover to cover. Blending sci-fi settings with the surreal and drawn with incredible high-def detail, you can literally spend hours on one panel and never get bored. I've also got in studio my buddy and graphic artist George Hodge, who's chomping at the bit to get to pick Matt's brains along with me. I'm excited to spend the next hour with two great folks for episode five. So sit back and enjoy our talks with Matt Allison. Matt, great to have you here, man. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely, man. I'm I'm really excited to talk with you uh, about your your life and career as a comic book artist, man. So, um, George, how are you, sir? First of all, I'm doing great. It's great to see you guys, Matt. It's great to talk to you again. Yeah, this is really uh, this is actually uh, apropos because um, well, George actually introduced me to your work, Matt, and um, I was blown away from the instant that I saw that I saw your work. So. Just to give a little bit of a heads up for those people listening in, I met Matt through a trip that um, that George and I took um, a few years back. We went to a comic con. What would you, what, which uh, one was SPX. that? SPX. That's right, SPX. Yeah. And uh, got to meet Matt in person and had uh, dinner with his lovely wife, and we had a great time talking art and drawing, and it was uh, it was a great time. So glad to uh, glad to actually be doing this with you today. So I thought maybe at the top, I would like to just, you know, actually get a little bit of uh, background as to how you got into comic book art and art in general. Um, you know, uh, comic books were something that they were always around my house growing up. Uh, my dad uh, collected a lot of Warren magazines. He had Creepy, Vampirella, mm -hmm. uh, 1984. He was a huge Frank Frazetta fan. So nice. that stuff was just always around me and we would sit at the, the kitchen table and draw and um, just, I, I have never not known comic books in my life really. Was he an artist too, or? He did uh, tattoos for a while. Okay. Um, Semi-professionally, he mainly just did them for his coworkers and his brothers. Nice. <laughs> uh, but I actually have a copy of one of his Frank Frazetta books that he owned in his early 20s, um, where you can see he redrew a lot of the paintings wow. on the opposite page because there'd be a blank page on the left side of each painting. And there's a Ooh. few of those that he actually copied. So Ooh, that's um, awesome. Do you still have those or? Ooh, yeah, I do. Nice. Wow. Yep. Yeah. So, so that started, uh, what, what, how old were you just started drawing even as early as you can remember three, four years old about, yeah, that sounds about right. Okay. Yep. And so then what happened to, you know, what was kind of the development of that? Um, you know, it was something that, uh, you know, every kid draws, we all have art classes, but, um, really I think it was in second grade we had an assignment to do uh, probably a book report or something. I don't remember specifically, but I drew a dragon mm -hmm. and I, I tried a very rudimentary form of cross hatching. So it almost looked like the dragon had hair, but <laughs> kids in my class were very impressed that it wasn't just simple line art that I actually tried to do some shading. Yeah. So this is second grade. I don't know how old you are in second grade, seven, maybe. Yeah, I think so. Sounds about right. Okay. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> um, so that just seemed like, oh, wow, I'm doing something a little different than the other kids are doing. And the teachers caught on to that. So I got a lot of support from art teachers very early on. Yeah. Wow. So then were you starting to take, like when you moved into middle school, high school, were you starting to take dedicated art classes or? Yeah. As soon as we had electives that we could choose, I, that's all I took as many mm -hmm. art classes as I could. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, wh where did you grow up? So this was, I think you were in uh, in Denver. Is that right? Born in Denver. And I grew up in Arvada, which is a suburb uh, just northwest of Denver. Okay. Great. Uh, nothing spectacular about Arvada at all, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> 
Now, yeah. were you taking? Um, so you were taking. You know, I'm, I'm assuming some advanced classes, uh, art classes. Did you start entering any competitions? Were you starting to create your own kind of comic books, or were you delving into any kind of other kind of art that maybe was kind of a primary focus for you? Um, mainly just any any type of drawing. Um, you know, we would always experiment with charcoal drawings. Um, mm -hmm. I remember one class where the instructor had us take branches. We went outside, we found branches and dipped them in India ink nice. and uh, drew that way. Um, but uh, um, really the... I, my the thing that I remember most in terms of art being shown to people other than just my family or, or other students was uh, my dad worked for Coors Brewing Company. And so our banking account was with the Coors Credit Union. And every year for um, the holidays, they would have an art contest for children of the, the people that worked there at Coors. Mm. And I won pretty much every year. At least came in, you know, third or second. And and what so, was the? Did you get like a like a twenty four pack or what was uh, what was the reward? <laughs> well, that was actually that was at a time where they let the uh, employees drink in the break room. They actually had a, a <laughs> they would keep cakes in the. You could have up to two beers on your lunch break. I feel like you have to let that happen. Exactly. Yeah. Matter yeah. of fact, we just cracked open a can of Saranac, and at the very top of it, it says. Uh, we drink all we can, the rest we sell. So it sounds like it was kind of like similar motto that was going on over there too. Yeah, yeah. And then everybody got back on their forklifts and you know, <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> loaded up trains. Yeah, that was, that was, that was before yeah. any laws or regulations there that were for safety, safety sake. And so. No, no seatbelt on the forklift. That's, That's right. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Well, my dad fell down the stairs there one time. I remember him coming home. Uh, actually, I think my mom and I went to pick him up. And his mouth was bleeding, his arm was oh, wow. bleeding, he had cut himself and fallen down the stairs. And I think maybe beer might have had something to do with <laughs> That's hilarious. So you're winning awards uh, through your dad's work. And at this point, are you even thinking about this as a career? Or or, or what, what, what was your thought process at that point? It's funny, I, I hadn't thought about this in a long time. And I was talking to uh, a friend of mine recently um we had career day when i was in eighth grade mm -hmm. and my uncle was actually in the executive realm at Coors. he was actually married or still is married to the daughter of the vice president of course so he said why don't you come in i'll take you around the advertising department nice i'll show you the, the photo studio you can talk to the graphic designers and to get to that building at Coors, you had to drive, like the Coors Brewery is in a valley and you have to drive up over the valley to get to the executive building. And my, uh, my uncle's in-laws lived there. They had a big mansion. And uh, so I'm seeing all this stuff. We're driving to my uncle's BMW and I'm just like wowed at all this <laughs> advertising stuff. But as we were driving back, you know, I looked down at the brewery and I'm thinking, well, that's where my dad works. Right. And that seems what I'm, that seems like what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. It was, and I, you know, it was such a regret now thinking that I felt that way, that I thought, well, I can't work in that other building. It's not right. You know, I, I need to be, and I actually worked at Coors for a little while in their ceramics department. Um, so I, you know, I, I'd like to say that I thought I wanted to make it a career, but I, I, I felt like it really wasn't viable mm -hmm. or realistic, I guess. Yeah. So even, even from the sense of, uh, I mean, obviously advertising is a completely different realm. Mm -hmm. um, they cross, they cross paths in certain ways. Right. Mm -hmm. But, um, but you know, obviously there's lots of different forms of, uh, visual art expression. So it couldn't have just been limited to the advertising part was comic book art or, you know, even seeing what Frank Frazetta was doing, was that even in the realm of, you know, maybe I could do something like that. I think because uh, when I looked at comic book art, it was so different from what I was doing. The, the level of professionalism, the level of craft was so far removed from my capabilities as a younger person 
And I wasn't really able to grasp at the time, like, well, these guys were young too. They weren't great out of the womb. They had to work at this stuff and they had to really hone their craft. But I, I, I guess I didn't really understand that until much later. So in my mind, it was just like, well, that's another world. Like you can't, can't do that. Those guys are geniuses. They're they're prodigies. You you you're. I'm not at that level. I, I didn't see it that way. Yeah. And did that continue for, you know, up until your 20s? Were you still considering kind of that this was not something that was even achievable in some form or fashion? I would say late 30s even. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I really did. Yeah. It it wasn't until I was about 37, 38, where yeah. it all kind of came together, and I felt like yeah, I can actually do this and you know felt comfortable enough with my style and my abilities at that point yeah it's interesting because i was reading that basically there was a what 15 20 year gap before you know where you just were out of the scene um yeah and i think i kind of want to jump to that so let's say 95 so you're in your early 20s Mm -hmm. right um at that point what was it? Because you had already started to do some self-published comics, I think, a little bit uh, beforehand. Yeah. What, what made the big? What made? What made you get to the point where you're like, I, I just don't want to bother with this anymore. And upon, well, let's just talk about that a little bit. What happened there where there was that created such a gap? I think it became very painful for me to make lines. And I physically or emotionally, no, no, emotionally. And, and just, you know, what was in my head wasn't coming out on the, on the paper. Yeah. And because I, I dropped out of school, I didn't have the foundational skills to um, create the kind of work that I wanted to be creating. I was just trying to do it on my own and, and running into, uh, situations where I just kept trying to draw the same thing over and over again without varying, without looking at reference. It, it just, I thought, man, if I just keep doing this, it's going to come out mm-hmm. the way I want it to, or the way I envision it. And when that stopped, well, it never happened. So, um, or if it did, it was so infrequent that it just felt impossible to me. And there was a night when I, you know, I, I kind of broke down and I told my wife, I said, I'm getting rid of all my art materials. I'm getting rid of my drawing desk. And I took all my stuff and she said, well, at least like put it in a box and put it away. Don't throw it away. Don't throw away your sketchbooks. Just put them in a box and put them away. Yeah. And, you know, sure enough, a couple of years later, I got everything out and started doing it again. And I would doodle at work. You know, I couldn't help it. I, I wanted to do it. I, and I felt compelled to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what, what was the, uh, what was the reason that you, um, job that you dropped out of, uh, you were at art college, right? Yeah. I went, I went to the Rocky mountain college of art and design. I'd actually out of high school. applied to Colorado. Yeah. Yeah. This was in, uh, in Denver. Um, and they had just started a fine arts department. They were, primarily a design school up to that point. Mm-hmm. And um, they were recruiting people to join their fine arts department. So they were giving away half tuition scholarships. Wow. And the school wasn't very expensive to begin with. So my parents jumped on that. They're like, you have to do that. You can live at home. You go down there, you know, it's, it's close by. And I ended up, um, uh, I didn't realize that along with the art classes you had to take literature and you had to take math and yeah. i had out of math uh you know after i think my junior year you didn't have to take math anymore right so once i got into a situation where i'm trying to do algebra after not having done it for two years i just stopped going to that class yeah and failed and ended up talking to a counselor there and they said look if you're going to come back you have to take that math class again you have to pass it and I just dropped out instead of doing that. Right. Were uh, you enjoying art school at the time? I mean, even outside of the uh, the math class? I think I was. Um, you know, I had instructors there who, when I was in a painting class or doing anatomy, uh, they said, look, this is, really isn't the school for this. Hmm. Even though we're, we're 
creating this fine art department, they felt like my ambitions and my skill level would be better suited at, you know, the Kansas city art Institute or someplace right. like that. So I was stuck feeling like, well, I'm, I guess I'm better than what they offer at this school, but I can't afford it. And if I go someplace else, I'll have to just take a math class there. So <laughs> it just, it just what felt like, eh, I'll just do it on my own. And then you, we all know where that got me. So, yeah. So, so what did you do at that point? Um, you dropped out and then you just got a career doing um, something else or. I worked at a print shop. And um, I worked at one print shop for 18 years. And um, right around the time that I was getting really frustrated with my art, I was also drinking heavily, um, had some mental and emotional issues that hadn't been properly diagnosed yet. And uh, I just one day quit this job. And um, just prior to that, I did my first Cancor comic. And I, I, I look back at it now, this was eight years ago. And I think, you know, I, I, I feel like I did that because I knew I needed to remove myself from, from this decision that I had made, which was quit school and work at a print shop. Yeah. And I ended up getting a job at another print shop, but I was able to really focus on my art at that point. Yeah. And yeah, I think when we met, you were, you were working at the print shop and I've always wanted to ask, did, did you like it there? Well, I guess maybe that, that's the first question, but really, did you like it there? Because did you find inspiration in any of the work that you were seeing? Or was it a chance to see, like, here's how I could make my own comic. Here's, here's I've got access to these things that I can make this a reality. Did any of that go through your head? Oh, that yeah, that definitely did. In fact, my mom was the one who found me the, the job at the... Uh, the original print shop I worked at and the, her exact words were, Hey, you could go there and you can print your comic books. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is, you know, my early twenties and it, you know, that when I finally did one was when I was 38. <laughs> so, you know, it only took me <laughs> 18 <laughs> years to years. finally get around to, to printing one, but yeah. I actually, that's not true. I had done one earlier on. Um, and in my, in the first issue of my, um, uh, comic book uh the most recent one i talk about how i i printed up this mini comic and i took it around to record stores and it was free i didn't feel that i was justified in charging any money for this how old were and you at that point i was uh let's see 95 so i was 22 yeah yeah so just starting to go to bars just starting to go to shows yep and i was at the show and this guy handed me a flyer and I look at it and it's my art from that mini comic <laughs> on the flyer. Ooh, and nice. I, I asked him where he got it. He's like, ah, you know, you know, my drummer makes the flyers. I don't know. And, uh, but it, you know, in my head, I was like, well, that, why don't I actually seek out bands that need flyers? And, uh, I just, I never did it. I, I never had the motivation or the, the true drive that you need to do that. At least not at that point. Was there any element? Was it? Uh, was there an element of uh, insecurity as well, or was it literally just a drive factor? Insecurity was definitely a big part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, I was just constantly comparing myself to other artists that I liked, and uh, you know, I'd see gig posters by Kozik and Coop, and and I was like, I can't do that. You know, um, Pusshead was somebody else I really liked, and. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with him. He did all, all the art for Metallica way back in the oh, yeah. 80s. Mm. Sure. So, uh, again, like use those guys as a as a level level stick and thinking, well, I, I, I haven't reached those heights, so there's no point in me doing this. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I kind of maybe, – maybe I'm wrong, but I get the feeling that you're a bit of a perfectionist. Is that correct in assuming that? Um. Yeah, I, I don't know. If, I mean, I, yes, technically I am. It's more about being a critic. I, I'm too much of a critic. Those are always fine lines. Yeah. yeah. Throughout those years, were you still kind of doing stuff on your own just for yourself? I kept sketchbooks. Mm -hmm. I, I was still, you know, 
I, like I said, I couldn't help myself. And, uh, uh, a lot of those sketchbooks ended up in the trash. I have a, a friend who just sent me a picture of a painting that he dug out of my dumpster. He said, <laughs> he, he said he came over one night, I was drunk and I was like, I'm throwing all these away. And I threw all these paintings away. And after he left, he went back and he, he grabbed a couple of them out of the dumpster. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. It seems to be this pattern of you just like getting rid of art that you didn't like. And then somebody pulls it out of somewhere and uses it. They're like, no, this is good shit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So what, what made, how did you turn the page? I mean, how did you get to the point where you're like, cause, cause now, I mean, your, your artwork obviously is incredibly detailed. Um, and I'm always blown away, not only by how detailed it is, but how freaking prolific you are. You just, you're just working nonstop. Are you making up for lost time? I mean, how is it that you work through so much stuff so fast? Yeah, that's what you just said. Making up for lost time. I feel like, you know, I, I'm going to turn 46 this year. Still a child. Still a child. Uh, yeah, mentally, for sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, that's that's the long and short of it is I wasted so much of my life not doing this that now I'm uh, I'm just full speed ahead. Yeah. Are, and, and is it happening full time now? Are you dedicating? Or... OK, great. That's awesome. Yeah. At, yeah. Once we decided to, you know, my, my wife decided to take this position here in Illinois. Um, it's like, well, this is a perfect opportunity to see how this plays out. And um, so far it's working. And I, I am stoked for this because I feel like when we all were hanging out, was it two years ago? Two or three. Yeah. Eating dinner. I feel like we were having conversations about all of these things. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's very exciting to see it all coming coming to life. Uh, and it, like Mike was saying, it's been great seeing all your posts, all the art that you're doing, that you're drawing more and more. Um, I think it's it's what I personally want as a fan. Um, and it's awesome to see as someone that, that's known you for a couple of years as well. Yeah, oh, I think. And I think at that time, too, you were still working at the uh, the print company. Is that right? A couple of years ago, two or three years ago. The second one. Yeah. 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 So I just left them, uh, back in, well, we, we moved here in April. So my last day was, uh, mid March. Um, I'm actually, um, I am, I, regardless of what happens with, with the comic book, I'm never going to work in printing again. So <laughs> that, that was a huge relief that last day where I'm like, I'm never going to step, I'm never going to, you know, <laughs> pull jams out of a printer again in my life. <laughs> I bet that was a great feeling. It so was. I, let, we should move into, you know, where you are now um, uh, and, and talk more about your artwork now. Um, I'm really fascinated by, um, obviously you, you see a lot of, Indie comic artists, I think, is a, maybe a little bit of a different um, fare, but certainly it's not unusual for um, a comic book artist to just do the penciling, and then you've got an ink artist. Mm -hmm. um, but you are uh, what your artwork is actually in, uh, so linked to your inking. Um, you're both a, a fantastic artist and a fantastic inker, and obviously they're they're both an incredible art form um mm -hmm. what was what was the precipice to you was it just out of necessity that you you know delved into being becoming such an incredible inker as well i i understood why comics were um uh, delineated in that fashion uh in order to get stuff out quickly you have the penciler and he passes off his pages to the inker and the colorist sure. um and and so all of that made sense to me but as as someone who really appreciates guys like dan klaus and charles burns uh you know i see those people and i think they're doing everything themselves and that's to me that's true cartooning um, I've, I've had my stuff colored by a few other people and it was interesting. Um, in fact, I just took a gig with heavy metal and had, uh, because of the deadline on it, I thought, well, maybe I'll hire a colorist 
and it made me anxious thinking about it. And I <laughs> just the more the more I thought, I was like, no, nope, I got to do it myself because I, I want to make sure it's it's the way I want it to be, not necessarily right, but how I envision it. That so I just have never really thought about doing it any other way. I, ha I have worked. Uh, I, I inked some Aaron Conley pages for the Henry and Glenn forever uh, book that Tom Neely put out. Mm -hmm. And he actually was uh, disappointed with how it turned out because he thought I was going to add more of my own <laughs> flavor to it. And I basically, I, I don't want to say I traced his stuff, but I was very, uh, very much trying to replicate his line because he tights, uh, he does very tight pencils. Yeah. You're trying and, to be respectful. Um, yeah yeah and uh so yeah i just that that way of working uh, like i said i get it it's just not for me well i i dig it a lot i've, I've definitely noticed a trend with with artists like yourself that i feel like before it was out of a lot of necessity like you're saying where you had to kind of assembly line it with the pencils the inks the colors the letters um, but i i love seeing this maybe it's not a new trend like you're saying with with clouds and and Woodring and all those other guys that they've been doing it for years, but I'm loving seeing more artists because I think your pencils and inks complement each other. Mm. Um, Absolutely. I, I just out of curiosity would love to see someone ink your work, but I have no idea what it would look like. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I actually was at a convention uh, with Kevin Nolan a few years ago. Ooh, great. And, and pencil. Oh God. I mean, talk <laughs> about <laughs> someone who just his his inking style is so him like you yeah. you know every time you see it regardless of, of who he's inking it's so distinctive and i he was doing sketches for people and i thought well i wonder if i gave him something i penciled if he would be okay with inking it and a couple people were like no nah, that's uh, that seems fishy <laughs> um to to do that and uh so i don't know he's going to be at heroes con this year so i may build up the nerve and ask him if he would be willing to do that i'd love to see it i would also be shaking in my boots if i were you <laughs> yeah exactly exactly <laughs> So you guys are a little bit more, definitely much more in the trenches when it comes to comic book art than I am. Um, you know, when you look at some of the classic um, uh, heroes in the comic book industry, like uh, uh, Jack Kirby, uh, John Basima, or Gene Nolan, I mean, what, were, were they ever uh, uh, good inkers themselves? Or how, I mean, largely they were just pencil artists. Is, is that correct or no? No, they... I... As far as I know, yeah. Busama inked himself at times. Kirby inked himself at times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it really was just a necessity issue just to get stuff out. Yeah, Because those guys, you know, when you look at the Golden Age and Silver Age artists, a lot of them didn't necessarily make comics because they enjoyed reading them themselves or were steeped in comics history or anything like that. They just needed a job. Yeah. So <laughs> they were taking as many books as they could. And, and you know, guys like... Uh, uh kirby obviously had a vision beyond just you know drawing somebody else's his ideas uh but someone like Pusema, he strictly viewed it as a job and uh, mm -hmm. there's a quote from him uh uh i don't know can i curse on this yeah <laughs> okay <laughs> he, Loudly, I, yeah. Can't remember, I can't remember who he was in the bullpen with, but uh, somebody was really fretting over this page they were working on, on a Spider-Man book or something. And there's like, oh, I just can't get it. And Buscema walked by. He's like, hey, man, it's just fucking comics. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about it. You're putting in way an effort on this. So That's um, awesome. Was, was Buscema yeah. uh, also a commercial artist? Like, did he do was, – was he doing stuff outside of the comic book industry or – that's a good question. Um, not that I know of. It's very possible because I think a lot of those guys did, but you wouldn't, you know, necessarily know it. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I always wondered if those guys got paid if, you know, let's say uh, they licensed some stuff out to a toy company or a toothbrush or whatever, and they threw a John Buscema drawing of, of Thor, if he made money off of that. Mm -hmm. I doubt it, but... I, I would hope he would have. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Your um, your style is very uh, incredibly unique, and I'm curious as to 
what were the things that informed you, whether it was a specific artist or a specific genre um, that sort of informed your creative direction? Uh, you know, I, I, I look at a couple different things that really kind of broke my brain open a little bit. Um, the cover to uh, Dark Knight Returns issue two, uh, if you're familiar with that, it full frame image of Batman, just fat and bulbous <laughs> and his costume is torn and he looks demented. And, you know, growing up with the classic Jose Garcia Lopez version of Batman that you'd always see or the Super Friends version, this was so bizarre and shocking to me. It really shocked me to see that image. And I felt emboldened by it that you yeah. didn't have to draw super slick and you didn't have to make everybody perfect looking. Yeah. I feel like that one broke all the rules. Mm. It like yeah. filled up the entire frame. Mm. It's, mm -hmm. it's ugly, but beautiful at the same time, you know? Yeah. I, I still, to this day, I can't tell you necessarily what the story is of Dark Knight Returns. <laughs> right. I know the basics of it, yeah. but I just, I love the art on that so much. Yeah. I tend to be that kind of reader for comic books. Um, I, I don't know if that's normal or not, but I tend to buy, and I, even when I was a kid, I would buy the art. I, I would buy it largely for the art. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I would forget stories all the time. I mean, yeah. even now, I mean, well, particularly now I'm definitely buying them for the art uh, rather than the story. It was almost secondhand. Only the story was important to me that it led to the cool art right <laughs> yeah wolverine's gonna fight well, a bunch of ninjas in japan like, right yeah great story. yeah exactly yeah yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah every every now and then you run across something uh, yeah. the the comic that i i was most engrossed in in the 80s was nexus mm. and it was primarily because of steve rude but i really enjoyed the characters and i enjoyed that story you read it every month but once steve rude was off the book i was out like <laughs> I don't care how good the story is. If Steve Rude's not drawing it, I, I'm not going to buy it. Yeah. Well, and let me ask, uh, I know kind of a theme that I've heard on a couple episodes of the podcast is music and art and the connection of music and art. And Matt, we can see some of your office right now while we're doing this podcast. And mm -hmm. I know you're a big Kiss fan. I think I saw Melvin's poster back there. Like, Yeah, yeah. Did, did that have an influence? I know we talked about concert posters and stuff like that, but... <laughs> Does that tie in for you? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think that, um, you know, you talk about Kiss and you, you think of the classic uh, Ken Kelly Destroyer mm. and Love yes. Gun covers. Those to me were like Frazetta paintings. I would study those. I would sit there with the LP. You know, I'm, I'm old enough to have bought those off the shelf at, at Sears <laughs> uh, <laughs> with my parents. Uh, so that the visual aspect of it is really important. And you think about, you know, the Beatles were making animated films oh, and man. Harry Nilsson worked on did that cartoon, The Point. Um, you know, so you'd see cartoon images all the time. Um, I remember at my grandparents' house, I don't know who it belonged to, but I found a book of John Lennon's drawings oh, wow. and they're all very rough cartoony mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. contour line drawings that he Beautiful. had done so it just art in general just felt like wow you could do anything you could you could go play in a band and you could also draw and obviously george you're you're doing exactly that mike you same thing so um yeah there was always a connection there for me and you, you play a little guitar as well right a little little very or, little or is that a secret <laughs> No, no. I always say I use the guitar as a percussion instrument. <laughs> <laughs> so I have zero finesse when it That's comes. That's the to same thing guitar. for me too. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so uh, you're in Chicago now. What are the, your? Do you have specific plans to kind of get out there a little bit further? Um, you know, what's the scene like over there that you're aware of, at least at, at this point, now that you've only been there for, what, a couple of months now? Well, yeah, I just, I, you know, I was at C2E2. Um, uh, what was that, like two months ago? Which one is that? 
uh, that's the big Chicago convention. Okay. Um, uh, I don't know if it used to be Wizard World, um, but uh, yeah, it's like the uh, Emerald City of Chicago, essentially. Okay. That's yeah. a great show. Yeah, it's a really good show. And as I was walking around talking to some artists that I knew, it turned out a lot of them actually lived here. Oh, awesome. And I just found out that Eddie Campbell, uh, you know, did From Hell and and all oh, wow. his uh, autobiographical stuff lives in my neighborhood. <laughs> and wow. when I was talking to him at his table, his assistant, when he asked me what street I'm moving to, and I told him, he's like, oh, yeah, Eddie, you're right up the street from this guy. And Eddie Campbell kind of looked at me suspiciously like, oh, God, is this guy going to bug me? <laughs> he didn't really, he didn't want to admit that he... So what I, you working he on? Just... Knock, knock, knock. So now you're walking <laughs> yeah, the streets exactly. yelling, Eddie, like hoping yeah. somebody responds. All right. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, Chicago definitely seems like more of a comic book town than Denver. That's seem a lot of great shops here. You got Challengers and Chicago Comics, Quimby's. Nice. Yeah. Well, there's a, a pretty good poster scene up there as well. I know Burden Machine, I think, is in the Chicago area. Okay. Who does some killer poster work for bands. Um, and I think he's got like a hub, mm. kind of a... Uh, community space for oh, designers nice. and artists that are doing screen printing work, poster work. Oh, wow. Killer. Oh, that's great. So I'm well, curious, you know, for those people who aren't, you know, maybe trying to get into, you know, indie artists who are trying to get into the business, what is it that you do specifically to try to get your art out there um, outside of like Instagram and obviously going to the comic cons? I mean, getting to getting into a comic con is already, um, you know, work in and of itself. Mm -hmm. What what uh, was your plan to get to where you are now, and and is there more of a detailed plan to kind of spread the word of of your of your work? The biggest thing for me has just been to uh, partner up with a publisher that will give me a higher profile, mm -hmm. somebody who's going to get me into more shops. Because I I honestly it it, it is a one man show with the exception of a lot of the, the support that my wife gives me. Um, but I don't actively send stuff out to shops. If somebody asks me and says, Hey, can I, you know, buy some to put on our shelves? I'll certainly do that, but I just don't have time for any of that. So yeah. to have it off my plate and to get with a publisher, who's got some, some clout and puts out good work has been a, a big goal. And then that actually is, is happening. Um, awesome. I'm working with Ad House Books with Chris Pitzer, and I'll be doing a collection uh, through him. So stoked for that. <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, I, I, I'm so pleased to be uh, working with him on this, and uh, I, I think we're going to put together something really cool uh, through that. So, you know, traditional publishing has always been the, the main goal. And, and if I can add, I, I've, I've noticed over the years you've – you've done it pretty organically just putting in the legwork you know creating comics every few months sometimes a little longer but uh <laughs> and then just you know hitting these cons in different towns getting lo the local shops to carry the books and i you know i equate it to music as well but it's it's you know getting out there doing the legwork and and getting people to support you one place at a time mm. uh, and one person at a time and i feel like it's all culminated to, I think it was last, was it Heroes last year that the Ad House thing happened? Yeah. Uh, that, yeah. You know, that that came together. Mm. Um, so it's been awesome. I mean, I, I, and it's been awesome to see you do it in that organic way uh, that there, there's not really a shortcut. <laughs> yeah. What is it like working with a publisher? What, what do they, I mean, obviously I would assume it's kind of like, you know, getting a record deal. There's all kinds of um, various ways in which they can skin the cat, but in in you know just to put it on a personal note what is it like working with a publisher for you and does that does that extend out in ways that kind of works like an agent of sorts or is it just literally publishing stuff that you create or that they are creating and then you're being kind of participating in in other words so like the heavy metal like you have you have a couple projects working with heavy metal is that mm -hmm. within the same context or and, and do you have freedom to move outside the publisher or how does all that work? Um, the, the heavy metal thing is basically work for hire. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, 
you know, something that uh, was was brought to me. Um, uh, I was contacted by one of the editors there. And so it's really contract work, but it's something that I, I were the subject matter not um, appealing to me, I wouldn't have done it. And uh, it's actually, they have a music issue coming out. Uh, I, I think they did one last year and they've been doing stuff. They did an Iron Maiden comic book and a nice. uh, Megadeth comic book. So uh, one of my favorite bands is High on Fire. And they said that... Um, Grammy award winning High on Fire? <laughs> Grammy award winning High on Fire, yes. Uh, worked with Steve Albini. The, you know, so, um, <laughs> but uh, um, so that in that sense that is just you know me getting a script from them i think phil hester is going to write it and just turn it in the pages when i'm done mm, very cool. um, and the publisher doesn't have any problems with you do you guys I'm, I'm assuming you work out some sort of deal where you can stretch your wings a little bit outside of what they're providing with you or teaming up with you on yeah they're they're kind of giving me free reign in terms of how the art looks sorry i'm i'm re-plugging in my phone it's that i'm out of juice <laughs> um, so there's really no representation there um you know i'm working uh with one of the editors um uh just on a you know a simple communication basis and in the case of ad house uh chris has been pretty hands-off I, I'm adding 30 pages to the book. So basically an entire mm. issue will be added to it. And awesome. um, he's basically said, you know, do what you want. Uh, he, he doesn't have a lot of creative input, which is great. He'll be good in terms of designing the book. Uh, mm -hmm. He's got a great eye for graphics. And um, if you've seen any other ad house books, you know, they're beautiful. Oh yeah. Uh, especially like the stuff he's done with Jim Rugg, uh, that oh, aphrodisiac yeah. book is amazing. Mm. So, um, yeah, it's all, it's all pretty hands off for the Do most part. Expect some, uh, pinups from other artists, sketches no. back, things like that, or. No, actually I I've made a point to, um, make sure that everything in this book is, is my own. Okay. Um, and it's, I've, I've been fortunate to have, work in my self-published books from other artists that's been fantastic yep um but i just feel like um i i want the book to be wholly my own I really nice yeah 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 good for you thanks um let's talk a little bit about cancor and how that developed uh that that started somewhere around 2011 is that right or was that a little bit uh, before uh probably that yeah the first time i drew him was to like 2010 okay and the the first comic that i published was uh 2011 okay with i'd been doing it as a, a web comic prior to that and then the actual printed version was 2011 and and how did that sort of develop where did you develop the the story and the character I honestly can't say. I, I really can't. <laughs> um, the only the only thing that I could say was the genesis of it was uh, there was a blog called Covered, where kind of alternative artists would recreate classic comic book covers. And at the time, I wanted to to be like Dan Klaus or mm -hmm. uh, Charles Burns and stay away from superheroes completely. Mm. But I was always drawn to them. And at the time I, that the covered blog came around, I was really into Silver Age comics and the absurdity of, of a lot of those. So I started choosing Silver Age comics to cover, and it really caught on. I got really good responses for it. And then I thought, well, maybe I could apply that indie sensibility to superheroes. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's really how that came about. There's not much more to it than that. And... You know your 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 style, like when you were creating the character itself, was it something that was already developed at that point? Because again, I'm still trying to calculate how 
you went from to age 23, then there's this giant gap, and then all of a sudden you're creating this really amazing character and and the environment that you've created that he lives within. How did that kind of come together, or was it just uh, was it a conscious decision, or were you sort of evolving into that over the years in the I guess you could say the hidden years of of your career there? No, it it none of it was. Um... None of it had come to me prior to drawing him for the very first time, the very first page of that mini comic or, you know, when it was a web comic, um, there was no pre-planning. There was nothing, you know, in my notebooks or sketchbooks about it. It just, I drew his face mm -hmm. and then I had, to, his face was all mangled. So I had to put a mask on him and I came up with this lilac mask with no facial features. And I, when I was a kid, I always got canker, so, canker sores, canker mm -hmm. sores, I guess. Um, and that's just where the name came from. Um, cause I knew he was going to be an extension of myself after the, you know, the first image that I drew mm. gave him a pot belly. Um, you know, <laughs> but, uh, I didn't want to go full autobiographical with it. Um, so it just started to come together. And by doing the web comic, I told myself I would do a page a week. So it gave me some time to, again create that environment what are this what does this place look like and i was inspired by the uh the paintings that you would see on the masters of the universe uh yeah. packaging yeah where it's this very colorful wasteland uh kind of barbaric but you can't really place it anywhere it doesn't it, it, you know it's, when is that when does that take place in the past the future you, you don't really know mm -hmm. um so th that that was sort of subconscious. Like I didn't actively say, well, I want to ape masters of the universe. It just was later. I was looking at those drawings. I got the dark horse book and I was like, Oh yeah, that's, that's pretty much where I stole that from. Yeah. <laughs> and the story, did it, did, did the, the comic book itself, like the first issue, did it actually, did you formulate what it was to be kind of like the overall concept or was it just sort of panel by panel and just letting it sort of evolve? Definitely the latter. I yeah. really, um, I, I, I wanted to keep myself from feeling constricted at all. Yeah. So I thought, well, if I, if I write all this out, if I come up with a full script, I'm going to get bored with it because I'm basically just transcribing what's there in, in the written, mm -hmm. uh, uh, page. And that wasn't interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And so I just felt, well, I'm going to go with the visuals first. And I, I would come up with an image that was striking or I felt was striking and just kind of base the story around that. You know, how, how did this happen? And in the first uh, issue of the second series, uh, Kankor is climbing this mountain. And there's these horns coming out of the mm -hmm. mountain. And then you see as he pulls on one of them, it's this giant uh, corpse of this Batman type person mm -hmm. or creature or giant and i had drawn that image first that was the first thing i did and then thought okay how why is he climbing that mountain and what happens afterwards yeah um so it, it's all it's it's not in any order so kind of grounded, some... it, you find something that uh creates kind of an anchor for the rest of what the story might evolve into yeah yeah i think it's and, good. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I feel like that goes back to the earlier comment about reading for the art, that that's one of the things I think I like is that you can focus. You, there's not a lot of word bubbles. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and at times there are, I think, when they're needed. But for the most part, you're getting that action and, and almost the freedom to to think about, like, where the hell did this Batman like head just come from? Right. Like, <laughs> like, what is happening right now? Like, you're almost in it with Kankor. Uh, yeah, it's actually one of the cool, <laughs> one of the cool things that I love about your 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 work is that I feel like I'm more on a journey of the mind of the artist rather than the journey necessarily like what would typically be in a comic book where you'd see the follow the journey of the antagonist or the yeah, protagonist yeah. or something. You know, I feel like I'm actually uh, stepping into the mind of Matt Allison, which is uh, one of the reasons I love paging through your work that's great that that's uh ideal that's what i would want to hear um because i'm not a writer i you know i don't i don't 
try to fool myself or anybody else into thinking that I'm, I'm great at that. But I, I try to take a, a David Lynch approach to it of just allowing things to happen. And maybe they don't make sense offhand, but I, I was reading some of my issues the other night. Um, I got stoned and thought, oh, I'm going <laughs> to read, read my own comic book and see how this plays out. And uh, I was looking at him like, man, I didn't even like I was getting things that I didn't get when I was actually drawing it. Hmm. It could have been the weed, but. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Are you a fan of the movie uh, being John Malkovich? Yes. Yeah. 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 It sort of feels like that a little bit. That's interesting. So, so are you, um, I can't believe it. We're almost, uh, hitting an hour here. Um, are you planning on doing, what's the, what's the end goal? Is there an end goal for Cancor? Are you trying to, are you actively working on, uh, different characters, different storylines? Uh, what's, what's kind of next creatively for, you know, kind of your own work? I, I think I'll always do Cancor stories. Um, once I get these additional 30 pages and the, the collection comes out, I'm going to take a break from that. And I've been doing a mini comic called Sweet Sepulchre, where I do these short black and white stories. And mm -hmm. uh, I really enjoy that. I'd like to do a, an extended version of, of some of that stuff. Uh, just, you know, simple black and white horror comics uh just to kind of get that out of my system too and then i'll probably go back to cancor after that matt that actually brings up another question i'm curious is uh you know with marvel marvel being as huge as it is and dc starting to really kind of stretch its legs a little bit more is that something that you're particularly interested in yourself would you ever be compelled or interested in getting a cancor movie produced with uh, big budget uh, spending you know, it, it depends. I've actually talked to uh, a couple people that work in animation um, mm. who were wanting to do some Kankor stuff, and it, it never panned out. Um, and at first, I was very much opposed to it. Traditional and or? One was traditional and one was CGI. One was the guy Ooh. working um, out of L.A., and he was pitching stuff to Ridley Scott's production company for uh, some streaming services, I guess. Damn, very cool. And yeah, and I, I just thought about it and I was like, oh man, I don't, you know, I have all these other characters that were from my first uh, mini comic that I thought, well, I'll leave Kankor out of it. You can use all these other ones because I'm not as attached to them. Um, I, I'm not opposed to it anymore. I, I used to think like comics, and movies and TV should be completely separate. Um, but uh, if the project was cool and it was cool people to work with that I didn't feel were like exploiting my intellectual property and, and treating with respect, I, I definitely would. That would be crazy to see. There's no way I could see traditional animation tackling all the detail with all the thousands of wires and hair and there's just no way. No. I mean, I can maybe see CGI, but the rendering of that would probably take five decades. <laughs> it'd be, yeah, it'd be something different. Yeah, it would have to be. <laughs> you guys remember Aeon Flux? I was thinking, I was thinking the head. Yeah, yeah or the head. Also, right. that same liquid television. Yeah, yeah. exactly. That, I, I actually, the other person that was going to do it, wanted to do it traditional, worked on Aeon Flux. There you oh, go. That's awesome. Yeah. So when he told me that, I was like, yeah, but he wasn't. Uh, he was a kid at the time, like as working as an assistant. Now he works for Disney. Oh, wow. Uh, but as soon as he said Ian Flux, it's like, oh, man, yeah. That's I, the I, one I, style yeah. I could see that really kind of uh, paying true tribute to the to, to your own style. Well, and I saw they, I, they did, I think it was CGI with Eric Powell's The Goon, but I haven't mm -hmm. actually seen it. I don't know if it's out yet, mm -hmm. if it's still in production. Um, but the preview they showed for it looked, look pretty interesting mm. like it looked like it could be cool um but his style also lends to that kind of smooth art feel yeah um, what was the name of the other what's the uh, i'm drawing a blank the the other it, it was animated but it was also a comic book it's a weird kind of muscly character um has a kind of a little bit of a bend to your style as well oh fuck what the, was it the max the max that's it yeah the max yeah, yeah. 
yeah. that animation is actually pretty dope. Um, you know, I've never seen that. I've seen the Spawn cartoon because that was around the oh, same yeah. time. Yeah, the Max but actually never... is animated really well. Yeah, I don't know if okay. I saw that. Oh. I remember it, but I don't, can't remember what it looks like. I would say, like, I I wouldn't mind seeing a completely retro Hanna Barbera version of Kankor. Yes, as simple and dumbed down oh, as, yeah. as you can get with the drawings. Because yeah. in my book, I've got you know I, I have the super detailed stuff, but I also try to throw in these very simple, uh, old school looking yeah. stories every now and then too. So um, I wouldn't be opposed to it being simple, but I'd want it to. You know, a lot of those Hanna Barbera stuff. I, I found a website that had these beautiful painted backgrounds from the Scooby Doo cartoons, which you think Scooby Doo, like, oh, there's not a lot of artistry there, but these are beautiful paintings. Wow. So I actually stole a few of them and, and threw my characters on top of them one time. That's awesome. Would you ever do any um, major superhero comics? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I definitely would. It, it would have to be the right thing. I think. Um, you know, there are characters out there like Metamorpho or Composite Superman that I love. And I would, if I had any opportunity to do that, I actually, um, uh, I don't think it's ever going to happen. So I feel like I can talk about it now. But um, I'd been talking to Gerard Way when the uh, Young Animal stuff was coming out. Hmm. And he was going to do a book of uh, short stories with the DC characters. And we were working on a, well, we were batting ideas around for a Superman story where Superman was kind of lost in space. And, uh, if that happens, that would be great. Um, uh, he's got his band. He's got a billion different comic books. And now umbrella academies yeah. that he chose super successful. <laughs> so I, I don't, I don't see that happening anytime soon, but, um, I, I definitely would work on a big two. I have no problems with that. I'm curious, like if you were to if you were to actually work on um, some of those characters, would your style morph at all to adjust to that subject matter, or would you stay similar to the kind of style that you're working in now? I would say that it would I would make every attempt to keep my style intact. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first started doing commissions for people, I felt. Uh, almost an obligation to try to make, you know, if somebody had asked me for a picture of Batman, I was like, okay, well, it's got to look like Neil Adams, Batman, you know, yeah. uh, that's just in my mind, like, oh, and, and quickly realized, like, no, people don't want you to just ape these classic artists, they want you to put your style into it. So I think I'm at a point now where I'm, I'm capable of doing that and uh, maintaining uh, the look and feel of my comics, but applying it to dream character. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think you definitely do that. I, I think it was heroes con a few years ago, uh, that was talking with somebody. And at the time you weren't signing any of your work, mm -hmm. uh, anywhere. Uh, yeah. but, but someone made the comment of like, well, you know, it's Matt out like that's his signature. I think it was Rico actually. Uh, -huh. uh -huh who's an awesome colorist artist as well. Um, but I was like, that's, I've never thought about it that way, but it's so perfectly true <laughs> that I, I think anything you do and seeing some of the commissions you've been posting, you know, it's you. Sure. Uh, even if you don't sign it, but I'm glad you're signing it now. Cause it, it is cool <laughs> for the people that don't know who you are. They can see the name. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've learned. Um, I, I just posted a, a comic I did for the band Guar, yeah. uh, for their comic book. And, um, I didn't sign it, and I don't even know if it says my name on the in the <laughs> indictment. So I was like, "Oh shit!" You know, I should have done that. But um, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think like you look at a Bill Sienkiewicz painting, you know, it's Bill Sienkiewicz. Yeah. Why does he need to put the big BS down at the bottom? But <laughs> I guess that's, um, one thing I can't stand is when artists sign their interior pages prior to publication. Oh yeah, so oh, you're wow. reading the story, and then all of a sudden there's you, you know the person signature at the bottom of the page. Like, why didn't you wait and sign it afterwards? But <laughs> to, to each their own, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so before we start um, wrapping things up here and and talk about what's next for you, um, you know, just kind of some closing notes on my end, and George chime in for sure. Um, you know, I absolutely adore your work. I think it's just absolutely brilliant. 
Thank and you. I'm really, really looking forward to, to seeing what's going to come next with you. Um, you know, for to get some value for young artists that are out there trying to make it as uh, independent comic book artists, um, I know it's a little cliche, but I think it's incredibly important. What kind of advice would you say for somebody who definitely didn't go the traditional route? Um, you know, for somebody who wants to get into um, the comic book industry and and do it their way, what kind of what would be your sort of maybe top one, two, or three hits of of things that they they could kind of uh, do to 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 move forward with that? Usually, if if I if if somebody reaches out to me and and asks me for that very advice, um, I kind of. Well, not kind of. I often will tell people to do things that I didn't do, which is copy other artists, uh, learn their techniques, um, stay in school <laughs> for as long as you Don't can. Do drugs. Um, uh, but it's hard for me to say that. I did a, a panel with Alexis Zirit and Buster Moody, and both of those guys, you know, super distinct styles. And somebody asked me that question and I gave that the answer I just gave and Alexis like, no, fuck that. You, you, you do it yourself. You don't need to go to school. No, fuck. Yeah. yeah no, you don't need to do any of that. And he even, you know, he kind of took me to task a little bit. He's like, you didn't do any of that stuff. Like why tell people to do this? So, I, I mean, to me, I think it's, you know, when, when the inspiration hits you and you find that character and you you feel connected to it, stick with that. Yeah. If, if you've created something, if it's just one drawing and you've done that very well and you feel happy about it, there's no harm in doing that drawing over and over and over again and making that your signature piece. Um, and But also branch out. Try different things. Uh, you know, if, if you... Uh, feel like, oh, you know, I could never draw a car. Make yourself draw a car. Hmm. I hate drawing guitars. They are the <laughs> worst thing in the world to draw. But I make myself draw guitars because it's like I will get better the more I do it. Yeah. So force yourself into into uncomfortable positions. So I should apologize. I think I commissioned you to draw a guitar once. Uh, <laughs> and you, you notice it doesn't look like any guitar that's ever existed ever. But that was good. That's yeah, what I wanted. Matt also doubled the price on you know, the commission. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> awesome. Matt, um, tell me, uh, tell us, tell us uh, what's coming up next for you. Well, this heavy metal story, I'm not sure of the publication date, but um, I'll have that finished in June. And then I'm going to hit uh, Heroes Con, uh, middle of, of June. And that's my last con for the year until November. I'll be going to Air Cap Con in Kansas. Um, but when the book comes out uh, through Ad House, that's going to be early 2020. And I will be hitting as many conventions as I can, doing store signings. So um, I'm just going to kind of lay low for the next, you know, nine, ten months and then really – get out there and, and work and hustle in 2020 outside of the drawing, obviously I'll be hustling here in my <laughs> studio, but I'll be hustling out in the streets <laughs> next year. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Good. Matt, thanks so much, George. Thank you, man, for joining us tonight too. Uh, it's been great talking with you, sir, and uh, all the best of uh, luck for you. And we're looking forward to uh, what's coming up next for you. Yeah. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. This has been a lot of fun. Thanks for letting me sit in. Matt, hope to see you at Heroes. Thanks, guys. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to the Pencil Pushers podcast. Follow us on Instagram at the Pencil Pushers podcast for visual representation of our guest artwork, topics discussed, and anything else that contributes to the show. Be sure to subscribe. Tell a friend. Tell lots and lots of friends. Become a leadhead. And we're out.